Roosevelt Montas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Yasha. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about your, your story, which is uh, really interesting and, and, and powerful, I think. Um, you, you grew up in the Dominican Republic. You came to New York as a kid. Um, and then uh, you, you tell this moving story of how a set of books and a set of authors uh, have changed your life. Um, yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about about your childhood and how you first came into into contact with, with these books. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Dominican. I I was born in the Dominican Republic and and came to New York in the in the mid '80s as sort of the earlier part of a huge wave of immigration from the Dominican Republic that's still going strong. Um, all kind of built on the legal infrastructure of the 1965 Family Reunification Act. So there's uh, just kind of long chains of uh, migration um, by marriage and family. Um, I was 12 years old. Well, I was two days shy of my 12th birthday. So kind of functionally 12 years old. Came to Queens, uh, not speaking English. Um, and uh, under, you know, kind of severely research resource constraints, right? I guess that's another way of saying very poor. Um, I grew up in, in, in a small rural village um, that was kind of, sometimes I say that it was kind of in the 19th century that I grew up because we didn't have many of the really amenities of modern life, like appliances, TV or telephone or stove, refrigerator, um, paved roads. Um, it was really kind of an agricultural, little agricultural uh, society there, town. Um, so, so coming so, to New York wasn't just a sort of cultural shock and a linguistic shock, but it really was an, an economic shock, right? You were suddenly in a, yeah. in a huge city with, with, with all of the excitement and all of the things that might be scary as a kid when you first arrived, coming from really a, a, a village. Exactly. And it was, it was primarily scary. Um, there is, you know, a kind of profound cultural uprooting that anybody who, who goes from one society to another experiences. Uh, that was compounded by the fact that I didn't didn't have the language. Um, compounded by the fact that I, by the fact that I was twelve years old. Uh, that's a that's a hard age for for anybody. Um, and the fact that we lived in a very precarious situation. My mother had a, a minimum wage job in a in a garment factory, which she lost shortly after my brother and I joined her. So we spent some years of very kind of very much on the margins and on the edge without, without a sense of what would happen next. And my mother, my family didn't go to college. My mother didn't even finish high school. My father didn't even attend high school. So we didn't kind of have a good way to orient ourselves here. Now that is, that is in, in some ways typical of many of my uh, acquaintances and relatives and, and, and fellow Dominican immigrants. That, that immigration wave I described before, it was largely uh, a wave of poor immigrants, in, in some sense, economic exiles, people who are fleeing the corruption and um, kind of disorder of um, Dominican society after a period where, where, where the doors were closed. And it was really, um, once the doors to immigration opened up, um, it began this huge flow. So in some ways it's not, it's not, it's not atypical. But it certainly was not easy, and it was a uh, just a great, a great fortune, a series of great fortunes that that landed me where where I live today. And and an, you know, key episode of that, which I tell in the book, was was my relationship to books. Was finding this this volume of Plato's Dialogues in a garbage pile outside, out next to my house, and kind of reading that book both awakened me to uh, kind of the life of the mind, kind of a. a the possibilities of an intellectual life and of a kind of source of meaning and orientation, kind of existential philosophical orientation that was in, in some ways a refuge to me. Um, and it also, that book initiated a, a relationship in my high school with a teacher that turned out to be very, very important to me. Um, yeah, so give us a sense yeah. of, of uh, you've given us a sense of, of your general life circumstances when, when you, you came to New York. How, how old were you when you came to New York? Just about to turn turn twelve. You're yeah. Just about twelve. So I guess mm -hmm. I never quite understand as an immigrant uh, under less difficult circumstances um, who didn't do middle or high school here. I never quite understand the American school system, but I understand it's about middle <laughs> school or something like that. Um, what uh, you know? What 
what was that educational journey like at first? So presumably there was, there was English classes, there was, I imagine that relatively quickly you became a kind of translator for your family as often happens in those circumstances yeah, where presumably yeah. your ability to pick up the language at 12 was much faster than that of your parents, I would imagine. And so yeah. you probably have to Absol help them orient yeah. as well. What was, what was that experience like in school and sort of what happened, I guess, up till the moment when, when, you, when you found this book? Yeah. So I went to the local middle school, um, IS-61 in Queens, and it was, a, again, in some way, a typical school in that it was overcrowded, overburdened. Um, I was in the bilingual program, which is probably even less well resourced and, and overcrowded than, than other parts of the school. Uh, and the bilingual education in New York City means primarily that you get you're educated in your in your native language, in this case, Spanish. There are enough Spanish speakers that are very large and robust bilingual um, education program with intense English instruction. Um, so your subject matter, main subjects, math and science and, and history, et cetera, are done primarily in Spanish with a lot of reinforcement of key vocabulary, et cetera, in English, and then very intensive um, ESL, uh, English as a second language instruction. That worked very well for me. Um, that is, I, I learned English fairly quickly, fairly effectively. It doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, you know, there, there, there is a uh, kind of a, a history or a, or, or a pattern where people enter the bilingual education program and never leave it. Um, or, or kind of their, their language instructions comes at the expense of just moving forward in their academic subjects, et cetera. Um, and indeed, I quickly became a translator for my family, not just linguistically, but, but navigating the bureaucracies of New York City and the culture of the United States. Um, just I remember endless hours at various kind of social service and agencies, welfare applications and, and, and housing assistant and, and food stamps and, and health care at the, at the hospitals. Um, just grueling and humiliating. I mean, one of the lessons I, I draw from that experience is just how uh, humiliating it is to depend and to go through the bureaucracies. The bureaucracies for public assistance, um, you know, I know them first in New York City. I don't imagine that they are extraordinarily different elsewhere, but they are um, they are just personally degrading in a very in in a, in a scandalous way that any any group of people that were uh, socially empowered would really not, not tolerate, um, but, but it, it does kind of take advantage of the helplessness of people who seek those services to provide uh, something that's quite, quite dehumanizing. And you can see aspects of this in the public school system. And uh, one of the reasons why public school system so often fails is because students are not, don't feel themselves to be, to, to be treated uh, with kind of dignity that they know they deserve. So they turn against schooling, uh, the turn against instruction and develop a kind of adversarial and hostile attitude to the entire project. It's, 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 kind, of a, it's kind of criminal um, that, that we do that. And again, this is not just specifically New York City and it's not, I am, you know, I am the product of New York City public education and, and, and feel extraordinarily grateful for the possibilities that, that it opened for me. Um, nonetheless, it is, um, there is much about the system that is, that is predictably um, designed for, for failure. And, and obviously we should bear in mind that your story is ex extraordinary, both in how you succeeded and, and, and probably just in how talented you were. Um, but, but, but what happens to you in the system? So you're 12, you, you go into this bilingual education system. Um, you know, it's interesting what you said, you found this, this book by coincidence on, on, on a dumpster. I mean, is there a recognition relatively quickly by teachers that you're smart and engaged and talented and they sort of try to push you and, and, and try to give you opportunities? Or are you sort of mostly ignored in the classroom? And, you know, thank God we don't have to worry about him. He seems to be going on fine. What, what does your intellectual development look like up until the moment when, when you find this book? Yeah, it is, it is something of a combination of both. On the, on the one hand, you, you want to not be noticed. You want to kind of be lost in the crowd, which, which was very easy to do. Um, you don't want to stick out. Um, but then there are there are some individuals that that sometimes I, I describe it by by saying that I felt seen by them. There there are some individual teachers who kind of over 
beyond over and above the the requirements of their teaching just kind of notice you and 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 find a way to acknowledge and cultivate something that that they recognize in you i should say that i, I was not i was not a standout student i was not a kind of a, an extraordinary i was not a, a star uh, i was a good student um, but i was not at the top of my class i was um near the top but there were there were a handful of students that were better than i was that they got better grades were more dedicated um i i was intellectually curious i cared about big ideas i was in some ways i was um a misfit kind of a, a nerd a, a kind of social socially um ins uh, insoluble <laughs> in the in, in in the environment and in the long run that end, ended up being being helpful to me because uh, i think that there were uh, distractions and kind of social outlets that i didn't have that then focused my energies on on books and on learning and on a kind of self cultivation um but i, I do want to I, I do like to emphasize the fact that that it was not my extraordinariness that accounts for the kind of life I had lived. And I, and I feel that, it, that if the right uh, encouragement, conditions and opportunities were made available to dozens of my peers would have had careers as kind of intellectually expansive and, and, and accomplished in, 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 in you know, many different ways than I did. Um, it is as as we all well know, success is something that is that is built on a whole series sets of social conditions and encouragements. Um, and I, I I happen to to find those in 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 kind of idiosyncratic ways, ways that, that were not necessarily built into the system. And so so start to tell us about that. So so you said that you discovered I think discourses by Plato and. Uh, that really got you engaged and then that led to a relationship with a teacher uh, who sort of encouraged that as well. So you see this book on a dumpster, what made you pick it up and, and what was the experience of reading it like and what, what did all of that lead to? You know, I, I, I should mention, I think there's one important kind of uh, condition, one experiences in my childhood. I grew up in the Dominican Republic with a father who is still alive, but he never came to the United States. Um, he was ex politically active in a kind of Marxist left-wing armed resistance to the, the, the strong man in the Dominican Republic, Joaquin Balaguer. And I grew up surrounded by ideas and debates. Um, and even though there were not books in my house, my father was always reading a books and he never kept books. There were no bookshelves in my house with any kinds of collections, but my father was always reading. It's a great kind of self, uh, self-taught intellectual. Um, so I had an orientation towards books and ideas. I, I, I sort of knew that there was a, there was an answer there. There was a path there um, to, social relevance and to, and, and to the narrowness of the experience that I, the, of the world in which I find myself in the United States. Um, so one evening, um, you know, one, one thing I, I point out in, in the book I wrote about this is that Americans throw away a lot of perfectly good stuff. And it's something that is it, kind of legendary in the Dominican Republic. The New York is a place where we can just walk the streets and look at the garbage piles and find all kinds of, all, all kinds of uh, perfectly good things, you know, furniture and appliances and clothing. Um, well, books, there were this, this, this large pile of, pile of books. Um, some of the books were quite beautiful and I only picked up two, two volumes. I, my English wasn't good enough to really, and I wasn't a, a reader, and, and, but there were, there were volumes that were, as it turns out, part of a, a, a series at Harvard called the Universal, Harvard Universal Classics. They're kind of leather bound, gilded edged pages this kind of very kind of stately and books that were clearly published to be placed in pretentious bookshelves uh to give an in, air in, kind in, of in the library room of some country club where nobody ever reads exactly them. and i'm sure that you know that 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 set that i found dumped there many many have eventually been perched this way um but they, they, they really caught my attention so i grabbed them uh i brought them home and started reading um, the, the Plato's dialogues, and and the dialogues contained there include the Apology of Socrates, and uh, the, the Credo, 
where Socrates is, is kind of turns down an invitation to flee uh, his prison and, and, and escape the death sentence he has been given. Uh, extraordinarily compelling stuff. And, and I, I use those dialogues today to teach every summer uh, high school students who are kind of like me, low income, mainly immigrants, first generation college bound. Um, I teach those same dialogues to them and I see them the students that is experienced something like what I experienced, that is being captivated by this figure and being kind of invited to a way of thinking about the world, a way of thinking about politics, a way of thinking about their social reality, that in many cases is new and extraordinarily empowering. Um, so, you know, haltingly, I, I, I started reading this, um, met this teacher at school who saw me saw me in the hallway reading the book and, and asked me, you know, approached me, um, he got very excited. He was Greek himself and, and had, had a kind of classical education at Princeton, had ended up teaching uh, high school after retiring from a career in business and, and um, kind of driven by, by a sense of, really a sense of mission. And, and so often it happens that it's individuals like this that kind of make the difference in, in, one's, in one's life, whether you are... Um, someone like me who didn't have access to many resources or someone who's just kind of has access to every kind of resource. It's resource. It's still individuals that tend to do that profound work of reorientation or, 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 or impacting you. Um, and what was most important in, in the role that he played? Was it uh, just having somebody to talk to about those ideas and somebody who perhaps could, could help you place them in context a little bit and tell you a little bit more about them, help you, you know, teach some of these texts to you? Um, or, or was it the sort of practical advice that he may have had, um, you know, helping you think about uh, setting your, your, your ambitions to, to get into a good college and, and yeah. the kind of opportunities that would come with that? A lot of it was the, simply the relationship. I mean, we, we would often stay after school. He was never my teacher. He was never, I never had a class with him. But we would often stay after school. Um, and I remember when I was in high school, one of the things that was going on was the, the, the first goal of war, the, the, uh, after after. Um, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait and George uh, H, um, you know, George Senior, George Bush Senior, gathered this coalition, and um, so I remember uh, kind of digesting the news and understanding kind of the geopolitics of this and understanding what NATO was, and um, so we would just have these very extraordinarily rich conversations, kind of philosophical, politically, historical, um, and and part of what it did was this. It provided a kind of emotional support. It provided kind of a sense of, um, I, I I have here someone, an access to a, a a different kind of world. Someone who kind of cares about me. Someone who is processing my world with me. Um, so it seems to me that a lot of it was kind of this this space, this emotional emotionally nourishing space that he gave me. Uh, the fact that there is an adult who pays attention to you, that there's an adult who seems to, uh, to see you, right? Who seems to, to, to care and mind you as an individual. Um, so, and, and then, then there were some practical things. He, he was the person who encouraged me to apply to Columbia. Um, he was the only person to read my personal statement. I applied to college kind of entirely on my own and, and was just did not feel first of all, did not know that a, a personal statement is something that you should really pour yourself over and work very hard on. Um, he, read, he read one draft, improved it a lot by his comments, but that was it, that one reading, that was all the, all the intervention I got, but it made Which, a by huge way, as, difference. As a real side note, because this is not what this conversation is about, is one of the reasons why I find it absolutely foolish that it's easy to measure the bias of the SAT and the way in which more privileged people might have higher SAT scores, but to think that something like a personal essay, which takes so much cultural knowledge right. for what people are looking for, which obviously yeah. uh, gives so much scope for uh, just the ordinarily privileged with, you know, highly educated parents to, to get yes. help, let alone yes. the people who hire very expensive college essay uh, uh, editing services. Yeah. Right? The idea yeah. that this is somehow going to be a, a social equalizer to, to, to base college right. admissions more on the college essay than on something like the SAT to me is just one of the strange, naive ideas that, that go on challenge. Right, right. Moment, right. Really it is, it, yes, it's, it's utterly untenable. Just, you know, just uh, on that uh, kind of same digression, one of the things we, I do in this summer program I teach um, for high school students is 
I teach them the summer between their junior and senior year. So senior year, um, they're applying to college. So um, my students, my high school students, I match with some college students who are taking a class I teach in the fall on American political thought, uh, which has a service component. And the service component consists of working one-on-one -on -one with some of my summer high school students on their college essay. And this extraordinary thing happens that Columbia students, for the most part, are expert at getting into a good school, are expert well, at Well, whatever else they may, may not be expert on, and I, I mean, I, I, you know, most of the <laughs> undergrads at, at leading Martin universities I've told are wonderful, <laughs> but they certainly are expert at how to work the system and get into a good exactly, school. Exactly, exactly. How to sell themselves, how to, how to craft an image of themselves that is compelling. Um, the high school students have no idea about that, and they often have extraordinary lives and, and, and don't know that their lives are extraordinary. Um, so you put these two together to craft their personal statements, and it's, it's been extraordinarily uh, fruitful on both ends, right? It's been revelatory both to the high school students and to the college students. I, I've had situations where um, one of my Columbia students has a younger sibling the same age, you know, high school senior who's applying to college, and they're seeing these two application processes, the kid they're working with from a low-income first-generation family and their own sibling. Uh, and it's, 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 it, it, it drives home a reality that, that, that you point to, but the kind of built-in <clears throat> inequities of the, of the college education system. Now, it isn't that there are easy answers. You know, we can, this is one of the criticisms of the SAT, which obviously is misused and, and biased towards all kinds of privilege, um, and I'll be. I want would love to get rid of the SAT, but what do we replace it with? Right? Do we go back to the old, you know, your letter of recommendation from your headmaster, or what school you went to, or your personal statement? You know, what what measures can we find? So it's not an easy it's not an easy question, but certainly um, privilege pervades the selection process of um, of college. Um, but anyway, I um, th th this teacher was um, was really both in 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 practical advice, things like that, and encouragement, but also building me up intellectually for for what has turned out to be just a life that is that is passionately engaged with with ideas and texts and readings. Um, not only because I'm a college professor, but just the kind of life um, I live apart from from that professional pursuit. When did you start thinking of that as a real option for uh, for what to do with a life? Which is to say that I think even a lot of uh, people who come from material security, who you know know that they're never going to have to worry too much about money, um, even people who may have parents who you know went to grad school and so on and so forth, um, often don't think of I could go and be a college professor. I could actually go and make my life about ideas in that profound a way. Um, uh, was that something that sort of relatively early on you realized you wanted to do? Is that something that once you got to Columbia and I'm sure that was disorienting and I'm sure you struggled a little bit, but you sort of clearly realized at some point, hey, I'm pretty good at this and perhaps I can do that. Or, you know, how, yeah. how do you go from, hey, I love these ideas and so on to this can actually be my life. Yeah, it began to come into view quite early. That is, what began to come into view was that I wanted to find a way to make a living by thinking and reading and talking about what I was reading. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if that meant uh, being a professor, being uh, a, a writer of some sort, being even some kind of lawyer or, or, or a reporter. Or just did not know, did not know what that meaning, that, what that meant. Um, and as I approached um, the end of, of, of college, um, it was very clear to me that I wasn't done, that I had kind of begun my education and it, I, I was not prepared to stop. I was not prepared to go and, and find a job. And in this sense, having grown up poor was a bit of an advantage because I, even while being in college, having a, a work-study job, which I did all through college, I had a work 20 hours a week and uh, in the dean's office of the School of General Studies and full times in the summer in the same office, I was making more money and was living kind of uh, uh, more comfortably. I had health insurance. I had a meal plan. Uh, I was kind of set up and I, I, I did not feel uh, 
the ambition to go out and start and, and start making money to go and get a job. Uh, I was perfectly fine continuing that relative student poverty, which felt quite quite an achievement to me as it was. Um, so when when I was approaching graduation, I decided to apply to graduate schools, not really thinking of of necessarily a life as a professor. Um, you know, I understood enough about what life in academia meant, you know, and, and I, I, for example, felt very committed to living in New York City. Um, I, I couldn't emotionally, psychologically handle the idea of uh, moving to some place that I had no reason to be, except that I had a job there to be a professor in college. So I went to graduate school because I wanted to, to think, I wanted to read, I wanted to write, and then I would figure out how I would make a living, including possibly being a professor, but not necessarily. Um, and that actually lifted a huge burden of my, my time in graduate school. Sometimes I, sometimes I think that I was the only happy graduate student of my cohort because everybody was just angling to find one of the few jobs in the humanities that there could be and, and kind of organizing their whole scholarship and their whole what they read and what they wrote and who they talked to and uh, what conferences they went to. What they did was organized around attaining this fairly narrow and rare prize that most people were not going to attain. And I was kind of liberated from all of that. I, I, I didn't, didn't, that wasn't what I was there for to do. Um, and that has meant that I, I, even though I'm an, I'm an academic, I've had a very unconventional career. I, you know, I don't have tenure at Columbia. I've just published this book that doesn't, doesn't um, engage with my real academic specialty. I'm, a, I'm an Americanist. I do American political thought, but the, this book I, I just wrote talks about Plato and Augustine and Freud and Gandhi. Um, so the life of thinking and writing and talking about ideas came into view fairly early on, but not this particular path that my, that, that, that my career has turned out to be. And it's, it's still quite under construction, as it were. You know, there, there isn't, um, it's not clear to me where I'm going to be five or 10 years from now. I think that's that's fascinating in terms of what it says about uh, how to stake freedom out for yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I was struck by some of the same thing you're you're talking about. It's not exactly the same thing. So you know, I grew up um, with much more access to to culture and 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 ideas. I mean, it sounds like your your dad actually his story reminds me in some way of my grandfather's story, who grew up mm -hmm. in. A village of what was then Poland, close to Lviv, um, uh, later became Ukraine, and may uh, terribly soon be Russia. Um, uh, but he uh, he was a communist as as a teenager, and um, you know he did not have a university education. Uh, I, I don't know how much of a high school education he had, but he was very engaged with ideas, and so obviously. Um, uh, you know, there's a parallel there. But when I look at my mom, who's a, you know, she's a classical musician, she's a conductor, um, in some ways, in terms of, uh, to speak of what you cultural or social capital, I grew up with, with a lot of it. But economically, we were, uh, you know, I'm, I have a single mom, there were years when she was doing very well in her career, and we had a decent amount of money, there was years when she wasn't doing all, all that great in her career, um, for one reason or another. Um, and we, did, we really did not have very much money at all. Um, and what it means to be middle class, even in a place like Germany, actually is just a little bit less plush than what it means mm -hmm. to be middle or upper middle class in the United States. Uh, and so I, I've been struck throughout my career by friends of mine or acquaintances of mine having a sense that they have to make a certain amount of money in order to be able to live. Um, I remember a, a colleague of mine in graduate school whose politics were actually very far left and who thought of uh, herself as a socialist saying, well, nobody can live with under you know, six figures in New York City. And I remember thinking, you know, most people who live in New York City make a lot less <laughs> than six figures. And clearly it's possible. Um, but that's because you know she came from not an especially rich but an upper middle class American family um, that took certain kinds of things for granted. And so it's just interesting how in your case, uh, and and in some ways in my case, not being used to that kind of wealth and not being used to that kind of material comfort actually gives you liberty. Now, obviously, it also depends on on each person's attitude towards money and each person's right. attitude towards how to lead life. Right. But there's something interesting in that, I think. 
Yeah, it 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 can be it can cut you loose from expectations and from a kind of narrow drive toward a, a certain notion of achievement. You know, what 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 would success mean for me? Well, you know, graduating from college meant success, staying out of jail meant meant success. Um, having a job meant success. Um, anything beyond that was just kind of icing on the cake, as it were. Um, so it did it, it did provide a certain kind of liberation and freedom, including a kind of intellectual freedom, um, because I, 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 it, it was very clear to me from very early on in graduate school that the kinds of paths available through scholarship for kind of a livelihood were just not interesting to me. There was something that struck me as hollow or fraudulent about developing a highly narrow specialization full of scholarship, but actually with very little substance, um, full of um, kind of scholarly apparatus, kind of academic apparatus, but at the center of it, there being something that matters very little to, uh, to the world and to anyone who is not already professionally invested in that. So it, it, it seemed to me, no, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I came to graduate school for. That's not what I have gotten from where I am, from where I've been to where I am to do. I am not going to spend my best energies and, 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 and devote my life to um, getting tenure. Um, that's and this not to me is, it. Is, is, is the great tragedy of a lot of intellectual towns in the United States um, and a lot of intellectual towns at universities, probably around the world, given the incentives, where people come and pursue a PhD because they're excited about ideas and they're excited about questions in the world and 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 then they're professionalized. Um, exactly, as, graduate um, school probably. kills it. <laughs> and you're told, hey, you know, perhaps you're interested in X and in thinking about it in this way, but to get a job, you really should be studying Y and doing it in that way. Um, right. And most people end up in one way or another doing that. Um, yeah. And and I think the, the promise of tenure is really pernicious in that way. For reasons of academic freedom, I support tenure, but 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 I, I feel very ambivalent about it because it's this sort of, you're in the desert and there's this oasis of absolute security and uh, you know absolute freedom that you're always looking at and you're always walking towards it. But you know, given the time scales involved, by the time you get there, usually you know 40 years old or something like that. Right. Um, right. And if you've been used at that point for seven or eight years of grad school and three years of postdoc and seven years of a tenure clock, um, so let's say 15 to 20 years um, to, you know, do the work you're supposed to do rather than the work that you're really excited by, um, you're not suddenly going to turn around and, and pursue your real interests once, yeah. once, once you have tenure. You're already invested in a professional identity. Uh, with colleagues and, and and publication and institutional structures that that, that drive you, and that's why you know I, I see one justification for tenure, and it's the one you said. It's 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 academic freedom, and that often means that the tenured protections allow you to raise uncomfortable questions, especially about the institution where you're in. Um, and I think that that's that's hugely important, ought to be protected, but it's very it's very little used in that way. Um, that is, the, it, it's rare. The even tenure professor that would that will raise these uncomfortable questions to the administration, to the governance of the university, and 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 politically too. The downsides are quite 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 significant, and I it it is not a to me is not a perfectly obvious equation equation um, that it balances out the tenure the tenure system as we have it today is worth the the cost, um, and it seems to me that there are there are real ways to ensure academic freedom. Um, that might evade some of the some of the some of the negative aspects of the of the existing tenure system, but I guess that would be another conversation. Yeah, that's interesting, but we'll we'll discuss that over lunch or over the year. If you <laughs> right. Like. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking. I you know, there's there's uh, idealists who think that ideas move the world. There's materialists who think that people are motivated by, uh, you know, self-interest uh, of an economic kind most of the time. I think I'm a dinner partyist. I think most of the time, <laughs> at least a huge swath of the upper middle class is motivated by, you know, what will play well in the next dinner party they go to and what will make sure they don't get shouted at at the next dinner party they go to. But that's also a different conversation. Um, one thing that's really interesting in this is that you, you talked about your experience of 
video language uh, instruction. Um, uh, there is a strong pedagogical ideology at the moment of culturally responsive teaching, mm -hmm. uh, where the idea is that uh, you want to make the material you teach relevant to the cultures and particularly the identities uh, of the people uh, who you're teaching. I think there's versions of that, which I find perfectly sensible and uh, appropriate, but, but often the implicit assumption is, you know, uh, to put it starkly, you know, a poor boy from the Dominican Republic whose parents uh, didn't uh, have a lot of education is just not going to be interested in Plato and they're not going to be interested in Gandhi and they're not going to be interested right. in Augustine. Um, right. So, you know, let's give them some contemporary, uh, uh, you know, anime set in the Dominican Republic and that they'll right. be able to relate to. And there may be wonderful right. contemporary anime set in the Dominican Republic if they're of high literature quality, I have no problem with that. But, but, but I guess, how do you feel about this way of thinking what and how you should teach um, yeah. and, and, and how does your story sort of uh, uh, intersect with that? As with many other kind of pedagogical theories or notions, um, you often begin with a important insight um, and then you formalize it into a curriculum or a pedagogical ideology. Sometimes this becomes a political kind of a policy question. Um, and then you end up with, with a complete disservice to the students, a complete kind of, kind of monster. And I see, you know, I see especially this, this, this idea of culturally responsive teaching to be extremely kind of fraught. Um, yes, um, you should take into account the kind of the cultural wealth and knowledge and, 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 and richness of your pupil in organizing how you will present the information and, and, and draw and build on that. Uh, and that's entirely when it's done well, when it's done thoughtfully, uh, is not is entirely beneficial, appropriate, overall a good thing, um, very powerful, a very powerful thing. Um, but that so easily um, devolves into a stereotyped kind of cardboard cutout of what this culture is, or what 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 is culturally relevant. You know, I often hear people say like say my, my, my home culture, the Dominican Republic. Oh, in the Dominican Republic, if somebody, if you go to a lunch and somebody gives you a plate of food and you don't eat it all, that is gonna be offensive to the host. And, and they're all, as if cultures existed with this rigid regimented and, and, that, and that the person that's serving you dinner will not realize that you're an American, that you don't understand the culture and will just interpret your behavior to this very rigid cultural paradigm. You know, there's all kinds of, uh, caricatures that 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 easily play into that um, by sometimes sometimes well-meaning well-meaning thinkers and or, or practitioners. Then there is this th this other aspect of it that is that is very dangerous that you alluded to this notion that this condescending notion that people who are from certain cultures or or say racial minorities or or ethnic minorities somehow don't have the, 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 the human apparatus to connect to big fundamental questions that some other, some other student does um, or some other individual does. I, I often think of, so my wife is an American white woman um, and, and this, this culturally responsive approach to teaching easily falls into something like the idea that you know, Dante is appropriate for her, but not for me. Um, you know, give give Roosevelt, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and Juno Diaz, um, and give Lee, Plato, and Aristotle. Um, and there is a just a, a reductionist, a narrowness, and ultimately a condescension to to that attitude um, that pervades education. That is, we I think we have done more damage than good by incorporating that uh, type of thinking into, into our curriculum. Um, I, as a high school student, found Plato to be very affirming. I found that you know, Plato affirmed and the deepest aspects of my identity. Um, I, uh, and by Plato, I mean Socrates, really, at least the figure that, that, that Plato gives us um, of Socrates. Um, 
that had nothing to do with my ethnicity and with my language and with my culture. It had something to do more fundamentally with my sense of self, with my the possibilities of living in a society. Um, this happens over and over again, that, that, that I see students are able to connect with, say, Dante, not because Dante is Italian, not because he's rooted in medieval Catholic theology, not because of his intellect, Florentine politics. There's something else in Dante that is the point of connection that makes Dante no closer to an Italian American than to a Dominican American. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I find weird about this, as you're saying, is that the logical implication of you know only uh, Spanish or Latino literature will appeal to somebody from the Dominican Republic, as you're saying, is that you know only English people are truly going to get Shakespeare, which is deeply offensive. Um, but when it comes to somebody like Socrates, it's also the weird metaphysics that's going on. I mean, Socrates lived so far ago in a society that was so different from either the New York of 1985 or the Dominican Republic of 1985. Um, You know, which of those two societies was closer to to Socrates? I have no way to start, begin to answer that question, right? Right. Right. Um, And so so there's sort of an odd idea where you think about, you know, a a trans-historical white identity um, uh, where suddenly, you know, the kid with roots that are not at all in Greece, living in a highly technologically, economically complex and diverse society in the 21st century, somehow is supposed to be just like Socrates in terms of their circumstances, where somebody living, uh, you know, a thousand miles away on an island that may be very different from New York today, but you know, on some levels is more similar, in some levels is more different, who knows, right? Like it's just such right. a weird way of thinking about what it is to be human right. and, and yeah. how our yeah. contemporary identities map onto, you know, the past or map onto other right. cu- cultural or geographical context. Yeah. And you know, the sad thing is that it involves a, a certain kind of reductionism and essentialism that is invented historically as a tool of, oppression is in you know the categories this 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 notion of whiteness and blackness and this cultural essentialism is it it, it, it develops in the service of supremacist racial supremacism of exploitation of enslavement um of absolutely absolute dehumanization of the other um and today it is it is adopted the logic is adopted so easily into a, kind, a discourse that 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 poses itself as progressive, that poses itself as as anti-racist, that poses itself as you know social justice oriented, and which which you know I don't really question the the intentions of people who advance this, but I do think that they are making a fundamental mistake and reproducing the categories that um, that are the exact same tools that produce the oppression that they're, that they're fighting. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I've been doing a lot of reading to understand uh, this identity-based ideology, which has become so powerful today. Um, and, and I think one of the crucial hinge points in this is actually a colleague of yours uh, at Columbia, Gatri Chakravorty Spivak's notion of uh, strategic essentialism, um, uh, which, you know, she sort of throws out there in an interview in the 1980s and she's been critical about how it's been used. So I, I, I don't want to put it on, on her exactly. Right. Uh, but that seems to me the characteristic move today where mm-hmm. somebody who's quote unquote woke would say, well, no, 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 we understand that all of these identities are socially constructed. We always emphasize that they're socially constructed, but because of the strategic choice, uh, which is understandable in itself of saying people are oppressed along the lines of these identities and therefore to fight back, it's really important that they organize around the lines of these identities, sort of to all intents and purposes, um, we treat these identities as though the essentialist account of them were right, as though there is this trans-historical whiteness which somehow connects uh, Socrates, uh, you know, to somebody who comes from a WASP family in the United States, but but, but not to you. And, and And so I wonder sort of, um, what your thoughts are on how we should be thinking about identity. We're clearly, 
you know, um, I love it when I have students who come from all kinds of different backgrounds of different life experiences. They, they can bring that in and that is an enrichment of a classroom, absolutely. And clearly, as you've been talking about, your story informs who you are and how you see the world, but it doesn't limit it. So how do we sort of combine this appreciation for where people come from, what the story is, how that informs them with a rejection of, of a kind of essentialism that would say Socrates is not for you. Right. You know, Gayatri Spivak was, it's, it's a friend and, and, and someone who, who I, I respect, but she can talk about strategic essentialism. And I think there is a, a very kind of rarefied theoretical, very heady world that kind of a understands what that is or and uses it self-consciously as a strategy. But when you get down to mass organizing and mass movement and the, and the, and the discursive regime that increasingly dominates our uh, public sphere, uh, nobody knows what strategic essentialism is, um, and nobody thinks in those terms. Um, that the kind of nuance of I will kind of provisionally, um, strategically organize around this category in order to mo mobilize mass uh, uh, mass movement and get something done, while remembering that it is a kind of a, a fiction. Um, that has not and, and I and I don't see it really translating into into politics and and what we have today is the essentialism without the strategy uh, the, the our contemporary social justice warriors by and large believe the essentialism um, and are not using it strategically but are using our are, are fully committed to this to this essentialist notion of identity uh, to this re reductive notion of identity. My sense is what we have is essentialism with lip service to the socially constructed nature. Of yeah. It, right? You will yeah. often hear in those kind of progressive spaces, oh, race is yeah. socially constructed. But that's nearly like a sort of mantra that then gets ignored for practical yeah. purposes. There's another aspect to, I think, the ideological posture that uses and pays lip service to strategic essentialism, which is a posture that says that all that matters is power. Um, that is, that you have no. Um, standard of, of truth or of goodness or of virtue or of justice to, uh, to refer to and to kind of triangulate from that all there is is a contest for power and anything that allows you to exercise or, um, or, or, or obtain power is fair game. Um, so whether we are essentializing and dehumanizing uh, if we do it in the service of acquiring power, then then it, it's fair game because all it boils down to in the end is power. Um, and uh, again, I I think that that is um, in in some way a uh, adoption of a of an, a kind of an ideological premise that is formulated in in the develops in the context of oppression and subjugation and exploitation, um, and that has been just kind of um ingested and and deployed by by the very people who were the primary victims of that type of thinking yeah so um what's your recommendation uh, about these classic texts you uh, were leading the core curriculum at columbia university for a long time um you are a defender of relevance of the ideas of people from Socrates and, and Augustine to, to Gandhi to, you know, a, a young, very diverse generation of Americans. Um, how should we be defending the relevance of, of these ideas? And what does that mean for how universities should act, how all of us should act? Yeah. One thing is to, one can begin by recognizing that the present has a past. That is that the, the categories, the institutions, the ethical norms, um, the political procedures, the, the, the economic structure, society, all that has a history. And understanding that history is the most um, empowering kind of education to alter, to intervene in, to adapt the, the, current, um, the current world. And to understand that past means looking at its sources. And its sources are sometimes called the classics, sometimes called great books. Um, and, you know, this doesn't 
only mean poetry. It also means, you know, documents and it means debates and it means philosophical treatises. But there is a whole kind of humanist tradition of debate, of expression, um, art, of, of, of artistic exploration that lies at the, at the foundation of our society. And that the best way to educate a human being to be a conscious, effective agent in our society is to acquaint them with that history. And there is no better, there are no better tools than the tradition that some that's associated with classics. Now it's a tradition that we're always revising, we're always discovering new classics, we're always finding new ways of reading them. We're always discovering new questions um, and new information that contextualizes what they mean. Uh, all of that is, is salutary and necessary and part of what the classics, uh, in, in fact, uh, prompt and, 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 and give an occasion for. Um, so defending the classics means defending a kind of education that takes seriously the idea that the present has emerged from the past. Um, and, you know, I, I think we don't need very elaborate and, 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 and theoretically complex arguments to see that. Now, the most important and powerful way to do that beyond arguing is to expose students to it. Um, that is, if you put this history, if, if you put this text before students and get them to talk about them, and you talk about them, uh, their power and their relevance becomes quite quite evident and quite obvious. Um, I always say that the most uh, effective way of um, the most effective way of arguing for liberal education is to do liberal education. Um, it is an experiential thing. It's like you know you can't you don't get the power of a novel by reading the plot summary. You just have to read the novel. And same goes with liberal education. If we in in higher education universities and of course. A lot of my book is concerned with this question about university's failure to educate students in this tradition of learning of, of, of humanist thought. Um, if we in higher education put that in front of our students, um, kind of the work in some ways happens on its own. Um, if we get students reading this text and talking about them in small discussion-based seminars, the work of transformation that that, that, that process triggers happens. Uh, I see it happening in my classroom with high school students from low-income backgrounds. I see it happening in my college classes with Columbia students, some of whom are low-income, some of you, some of whom are as high income as you can get. Um, engaging in the kinds of human conversations that pertain to us and matter to us by virtue of that shared humanity. Doing so around texts that have a kind of a, a proven record of stimulating and capturing this kind of thought. Um, that does it. That really does it. Roosevelt, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure, Yasha. Thank you for having me here.